Okay, here's where we're gonna get, we are going to get a little philosophical. <sighs> you ready? Here we go. You don't know what reality is, and I don't know what reality is. All we know is what our brains tell us is there. Are our brains telling us what exactly is in the outside world? I don't know. How could we possibly know? How could I use my brain to figure out what my brain is not telling me? I couldn't. Uh, so the principle of neural representation and, and people who like the video, uh, I'm sorry, the movie of The Matrix really uh, love this concept. The idea, the principle of neural representation is you don't know what the world says, you just know what your neurons tell you the world says. So we assume that our brain accurately reflects reality, but we don't know. We don't know the ways in which it changes realities. We just don't know. Uh, kind of wild. It's as if someone is translating what another person is saying to us, but the translator, how much trust do you have in the translator? Is the translator accurately translating what the other person says? Of course, then there's the argument in translation of whether translation is ever actually really possible because languages express ideas in different ways. Anyway, something to keep in mind. All you know is what your brain tells you is there. Okay, what do we think the relationship is between neural activity, so activity in your brain, and your experience? What's the language that your brain uses to give rise to your experiences? Well, as far as we know, the timing of neural activity and the location of neural activity somehow give rise to different experiences. Now, I know that might not be terribly satisfying because it's hard to, for us to imagine how one timing rate of a set of neurons or uh, would give rise to my experience of uh, eating a chocolate bar and different neurons working at a different temporal rate at a different location of the brain give rise to my experience of uh, hearing Elton John sing Rocket Man. I mean, they're very different experiences. Elton John singing and the taste of a chocolate bar, and yet somehow neural activity gives rise to both. Something about the timing, something about the location, we know that much. Uh, uh, we could talk about a few different sort of languages or codes um, that might be used to translate or to give rise to different experiences. It's going to be um, specificity coding, population coding, and sparse coding. Specificity coding is when an experience results from the activity of one neuron, one. Uh, population coding is when your experience results from the activity of all of your neurons or a huge population of neurons. And sparse coding is when a particular experience gives rise, a particular experience comes from the activity of just a few neurons. So what do I mean by that? Okay, specificity coding. Imagine that your brain, instead of having 86 billion neurons, it only had 10. And you had three friends in the world, who are they? Bill, Mary, and Raphael. Uh, how could specificity theory explain your ability to recognize each of those people? Well. Um, specificity theory would say, well, one neuron over here codes for when that neuron fires, you know you've seen your friend Bill. And when a different neuron over here fires, you know that means Mary's present. And when a third neuron somewhere else fires, then you know that Raphael's present. Uh, sometimes in the past, people have talked about the single neuron idea as a grandmother cell. Um, the idea being that one cell gives rise to your experience of your grandmother. Of course, that raises the question, 
what happens when that cell dies? Would grandma disappear? Would you no longer remember grandma? How would that, there's all sorts of issues and complexities with um, uh, specificity theory that, that make it seem easy to understand, but unlikely to work, I guess is the best way to put it. Population coding. Okay, let's say one neuron, that seems kind of silly, right? So maybe it's the activity of lots and lots of different neurons that give rise to each of our experiences. So here's a, a cartoon of how that might work with, you know, a neuron, a, a brain that had only 10 neurons. Um, makes intuitive sense um, that you would use big parts of your brain to code for complicated things like your friend Phil. Um, but it's challenging for neuroscientists to understand how that might work. Most people think that population coding is the way it actually works, but um, proving it's a challenge. Um, there is also something sort of in between uh, specificity coding and population coding called sparse coding, where it's not one neuron uh, that gives rise to a particular experience, but small collections of neurons. And that'll work, um, it's, it's been shown to work in, in various vision research that I know of, um, as long as you're talking about very, very simple things, um, like the direction, like direction of translation of some dots, for example. Okay, so, so far I've told you that um, your brain will have different responses to different stimuli. So when Bill shows up, you might have one pattern of neural activity. And when Susie shows up, you might have another um, uh, pattern of neural activity. But um, there's a big question or gap in the literature, which is why I'm using the British term mind the gap, uh, which comes from their subway system, which has gaps in it. But um, what is the relationship between the activity of neurons and experiences, right? This is a question we got at before with the, some neurons fire and I experience chocolate, other neurons fire and I experience Mick Jagger. How? How is it that some neural activity or any neural activity gives rise to any particular experience? We don't know. It's a huge gap in the literature, um, but a lot of smart people are working on it. Okay. In cognitive psychology and in cognitive neuroscience, in fact, in all of neuroscience, actually in all of the sciences, there are, you can explain any phenomenon at different levels. So levels of uh, explanation. I got to tell you that no one neuron is going to produce cognition. As far as we know, no individual neuron uh, makes you, is a, no individual neuron gives rise to a particular memory. No individual neuron um, uh, is used to understand a particular word or aspect of language. Somehow, um, cognition is produced by neural activity at lots of different levels or lots of different processes that are happening at different levels. So that synapses are communic communicating information between neurons. Neurons are connected up in particular ways, forming networks, and somehow that is involved. Um, we've talked about the maps. We've talked about you know population coding, and there might be whole systems. Something about those different levels gives rise to cognitive psychology. Um, and the only way to figure it out is to conduct research at all of those different levels and to combine that research across different levels of analysis. That's tricky. That's really tricky. But to make monumental steps forward in cognitive neuroscience, that's exactly what we need to do. Okay. That's it for this mini lecture. Come back and we'll talk about localization of function.